What's going on, church? Hey, I hope that you are having an amazing day. In fact, I want to let you know all week this week, you have been at the top of my mind, and I have been praying for you daily. Last week, we had fall launch at the city park, had a great time with the picnic, and then also starting our brand new series called Promised Land based on the book of Joshua. And last week, we talked about Joshua chapter 1. One thing that I forgot to mention last week is we do have a journal that actually goes along with this whole series. Um, and if you would like one of those, they're $5. But what it is, is it's got the chapters and then it's got a blank piece of paper right by it. So every single chapter in Joshua, um, and this is in book form where you can actually take notes as we go through this series, because this series is going to be absolutely phenomenal. So if you want one of those, definitely reach out to me, either messenger me or call me, and I will make sure that you get one of those journals. Before we jump into Joshua chapter two, let's go ahead and take a minute and pray. Jesus, I want to thank you for another amazing day that we have to gather together as the church. I pray that as we explore your word through Joshua chapter two, that the words that you desire for us to take and apply to our heart pop out and shine and illuminate our soul. In your name we pray. All God's people said, amen. All right. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to jump into Joshua chapter two. And I've actually titled this one, The Army, The Spies, The Prostitute, and The Red Rope. <laughs> How's that for a title, huh? <laughs> Let's go ahead and read Joshua chapter 2, starting with verse 1. Here we go. Then Joshua secretly sent out two spies from the Israelite camp to the Acacia Grove. He instructed them, scout out the land on the other side of the Jordan River, especially around Jericho. The city of Jericho was a very well-built city where the walls towered high about 40 feet into the sky. Jericho was no joke. A lot of these walls were double enforced. In fact, to be able to get into Jericho, it would be quite a fight. Uh, in fact, the, the city of Jericho was so evil that Joshua actually uh, curses the city. And he curses it to the point where he, he expects nothing to even grow in that land. A lot of the times when scholars were looking into why Joshua pronounced a curse over Jericho, it actually had to do with child sacrifice and the amount of evil that was involved with child sacrifice. So it goes on and it says this. It says, so the two men set out and came to the house of the prostitute named Rahab. And they stayed there that night. But someone told the king of Jericho, some Israelites have come here tonight to spy out the land. So the king of Jericho sent orders to Rahab. Bring out the men who have come to your house, for they have came here to spy out the land. Rahab had hidden the two men, but she replied, Yes, the men were here earlier, but I didn't know where they were from. They left the town at dusk as the gates were about to close. I don't know where they went. If you hurry, you can probably catch up with them. And, and actually, uh, she had taken them up to the roof, which is kind of funny. She's telling them that they could actually catch up, but she had taken to the roof and they, she hid them under a couple bundles of flax. So the, the uh, verse goes on, it says, So the king's men went looking for the spies along the road leading to the shallow crossings of the Jordan River. And as soon as the king's men had left, the gate of Jericho was shut. Before the spies went to sleep that night, Rahab went up on the roof to talk to them. And she said these words, which I think are absolutely fascinating. She said, I know the Lord has given you this land, she told them. We are all afraid of you. In fact, everyone in the land is living in terror. And she goes on to explain why right here. This is, this is awesome. She says, For we have heard how the Lord made dry path for you through the Red Sea when you left Egypt. Now this is some 40 years back, but she's referring to crossing on dry land through the Red Sea. She was educated. She was smart. She knew that the Lord fought for Joshua and his army. And that's why the town was in terror. And it goes on and says, Our hearts have been melted in fear. No one has the courage to fight. 
after hearing such thing. And then she makes this bold, audacious, amazing, beautiful statement that actually speaks volumes to what she believes. And you listen to this. She says, For the Lord your God is the supreme God of the heavens above and the earth below. Here you have Rahab, a prostitute, who just declared publicly her faith in God. So if you're taking notes, write this down. Rahab's words are a declaration of faith in God. Romans chapter 10, 9, it says this. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved, which is a declaration of faith. So the question that I have for you uh, today is, have you declared the Lord to be the Lord of your life? Have you confessed him and pronounced him and put him in front of everything that you've got going on to lead your life? And that's what Rahab was doing right here. It goes on and it says, now swear to me, and she's talking to the spies. She says, now swear to me by the Lord that you will be kind to me and my family since I have helped you. Give me some guarantee that when Jericho is conquered, and I love how she said when Jericho is conquered, she already knew that God was going to come in and take the land that he promised Joshua. When Jericho is conquered, promise me that you will let me live along with my father and my mother, my brothers and my sisters and their families. We offer our, our own lives as a guarantee for your safety, the men agreed. But if you don't betray us, we will keep our promise and be kind to you when the Lord gives us the land. Then, since Rahab's house was built into the town wall, she let them down by a rope through the window. Escape to the hill country, she told them. Hide there for three days from the men searching for you. Then when they have returned, you can go on your way. So before they left, the men told her, we will be bound by our oath that we... We have been bound by our oath. We have taken only if you follow these instructions. When we come to the land, you must leave this scarlet rope hanging from your window through which you let us down. And all of your family members, this is the men that are, that are reinstating their oath to Rahab. And all of your family members, your father, your mother, your brothers, and all your relatives must be inside the house. And if they go out into the street and are killed, we are not at fault. And then they go on and, and, and they say this thing. They say, but if anyone lays a hand on the people inside this house, we will accept the responsibility for their death. Death. If you betray us, however, we are not bound by this oath in any way. I accept your terms, she replied. And she sent them on their way, leaving the scarlet rope hanging from the window. Here's what Rahab's faith did. As she spoke with these men, Rahab's faith, if you're taking notes, saved her family. Remember, what you choose about faith will most likely affect everyone in your family. So the question that I have for you today is, what will you choose of your faith? Will you choose to follow Christ? Even though there are difficult times ahead and there are difficult times that many are going through right now, and maybe you're one of them going through a very difficult time, will you choose to continue to follow Christ? Because what you choose about faith not only affects you, but it affects your family members. It affects your bosses. It affects everyone who comes into contact with you. Because if we declare Jesus as Lord, other people around us are going to see that. They're going to recognize that. And you and I will have a great impact by the Spirit of God working in and through us so that those around us will be able to feel the glory of God. Isn't that good news? What have you chosen about faith today? There's a few other questions that we need to ask about this story. 
In fact, when we study scripture, some really good questions to ask is, where is God in this? Where is Jesus in this? Where am I in this? What can I do to apply this to my life? And who can I share it with, right? So check this out. Where is God in this story? Well, God is giving grace to a prostitute. I find it fascinating that the one person in the community that everybody else has written off and said, that person doesn't deserve the best in her life. Those people that have heard the different noises next door and the different exchanges that have happened between Rahab and many other people and many men that have come and gone from her house, God gave the prostitute grace. Isn't that amazing? We serve a God who gives us grace. And I love the fact that the God that we serve is a God who doesn't look at the mistakes that we've made and doesn't look at all the thoughts sometimes that we think and go, yeah, gross, who are you? I thank God that we serve a God who is full of grace and pushes us beyond those mistakes and is with us and he will never forsake us and he will never leave us. He never gives up on us. Even if other, other people do, God never does. That's the God we serve. In fact, Luke 7, 34 says this, Jesus, a friend of the tax collectors and of sinners. Who did Jesus hang out with? He hung out with those whose society thought was on the lowest rung. He hung out with the people who were despised by other people. Why? Because he loved them and he cared for them and he wanted them to have an opportunity to understand that they haven't been written off yet. Did you know today that you haven't been written off? And I love what Jesus, what Jesus says in Matthew 21, 31. He says, I tell you the truth, corrupt tax collectors and prostitutes will get into the kingdom of heaven before you. As he's speaking to religious leaders. Why did he say that? Because if you look in Matthew chapter one, which is the genealogy of Jesus, there's a person who shows up that a lot of people didn't think would show up. And it's Rahab, the prostitute. You see, he was telling these people, my great, 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 grandma, Rahab. She's in my bloodline. I know she's in heaven. Let's move on. Where is Jesus in this story? Well, he's the red rope. He's the rescue. Isn't it interesting that the, the rope that Rahab hung from her window was scarlet? Isn't it amazing that the blood that Jesus shed for us is red, scarlet? It's the rescue. Rahab helped rescue those spies. And you know what? Jesus rescued us from the bondage of sin and death so that we can spend eternity with him. Jesus is in this story. <laughs> We've been washed by the blood of Christ. Our sins are no longer held against us. Someone say amen. So where are we in this story? Well, this is kind of humbling. If you're taking notes, write this down. We are the enemies of God. How are we the enemies of God, Kevin? Well, like Jericho is destroyed, those who choose to do their own thing and ignore Christ's love and grace will be crushed in the end. We, we start as an enemy of God and we have a choice to make. Do we want to remain an enemy of God or do we want to become a friend of God? Do we want to become a child of God? Many of you right now can think back to the moment where it was post Jesus, the moments where you were making the decisions for your life, the moments when you didn't think that you needed God in your life, the moments when you weren't living on the right track that God desired for you to live on. And where did that lead you? Listen, many of you will answer this question. It led us down a dead road. Then we remember the post Christ experience when we chose Jesus and we honored Jesus and we lived for Jesus. And where did that lead us to? A life of abundance and fulfillment. And here we are today, believers. We get to choose. We go from enemy to child when we choose Christ. In fact, in uh, Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians 1, 7 through 10, it says, when the Lord Jesus appears from heaven, he will come with his mighty angels in flaming fire, bringing judgment on those who do not know God and those who refuse to obey the good news of our Lord Jesus Christ. We must choose to obey the good news of the Lord Jesus. <laughs> If you haven't done that, do that today. Say something like this, Jesus, I choose you. Forgive me of my sins so that I can spend eternity with you. I give you the leadership of my life and the lordship of my life. 
Amen. All right. We are also the army of God. Like the spies, we go behind enemy lines. In fact, Matthew chapter 28, 10, if Jesus were going to go ahead and give you your rules of engagement to go behind enemy lines, and if Jesus was going to give you the pump up conversation, the pump up, you know, moment where he gathers his army around and he was going to leave them with a declaration and a mission. This is what he would, he would say in Matthew chapter 28, 19, he would say this, go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the father and the son and the Holy spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded to you. And those are our marching orders today. What he said in Matthew chapter 28 are our marching orders right now. The reason reason why we desire for Becker and Clear Lake and the surrounding area to know Jesus is because Jesus told us to go to those areas and declare the good news, bringing all mankind to those areas where they can hear the gospel so that they too can give their lives to Jesus and become disciples and be baptized and continue to follow him. That's why we do this. Those are our marching orders as the army of God. And last but not least, we are the prostitute. Now, there's something you don't think about every day, right? And I honestly thought that I would never say something like that in church. But here's what I mean. We are just like Rahab, asking for the grace of God in our lives. Acts chapter 16, 30 through 31, it says this. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? So they said, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. Every single one of us gathered is just like Rahab. We've all got our stuff that is not pleasing to God. We've all had the moment where we needed to choose what we believe. And we chose grace. We chose the loving, undeserved grace that God can give us. And only God can give us that. Isn't it so good to know today that you live in his grace? Isn't it so good to, to know that, that your mistakes have not been held against you? In fact, one of my favorite passages of scripture that you can read Jesus says, I've removed your sin and I've thrown it to the bottom of the ocean, never to be seen again. When we're believers, his grace covers us. Just like Rahab kept the rope hanging from her window, Jesus hung on a cross and his saving grace, the blood that was shed, brings forgiveness and rescues our soul. Hey, listen. I want you to know that today is going to be a great day. I know that God loves you. I love you. And I'll see you soon. God bless. We'll talk to you later. Bye.